All right, welcome back to another Koenji Sean Reviews. And in this video, I'm going to introduce to you Kojima Miyako Horror Manga Ka from, incidentally, right here in my neighborhood of Koenji. So how could I not introduce her and her awesome works to you? In the beginning of this video, I'll talk a little bit about her history, and then we'll turn and look at some of her influences and her panels and do a comparison between the two. To start off with, though, uh, Miyako Kojima, when she was a child, she wasn't really a very healthy child. She was a bit sickly. So she started off by living in a kind of a convalescent dormitory slash school. Um, I'm getting a lot of this from her 2002 release, Otome Zukan, or the Encyclopedia of Maidens, in which at the back, there's like a four or five page interview with her that really details how she got started out. So that's a great resource, incidentally, you know. But uh, so she wasn't a really healthy kid, but the dormitory where she lived in, since she wasn't allowed to play outside that much, she was stuck inside. And luckily they had a reading room. In that reading room, there was a bunch of shonen and shoujo manga, which she just devoured. And by the age of 14, only 14, she was already working as an assistant for Hagiwara Reiji, who did the series that was quite popular, I believe in the 90s, Red, Red Do. So she worked as an assistant for him. When she started off as an assistant, she worked under the name of Neko Miyako. Neko means cat, of course. And that was her pen name at that time. Uh, I think under that pen name, she did, the, she did the Dragon Quest series under him. And then she, as an assistant, you just kind of work on whatever the main person you're working under is working on. So she got like assistant credits for those. And then in... You know, around 20 years old, I guess she was in a punk band or a rock band here in Koenji. Koenji's got like a vibrant music scene, so that's not surprising growing up in Koenji. But in her interview, she said that she needed to make some money. For some reason, I want to say for her cat. But at any rate, she needed to make some money, so she went back to working as a manga cop. Um, around this time also, she was, while working as an assistant, she was asked by her editor if she would like to do a tankobon and release her own thing. And she did that in 1992 with her release of Jun Namakido. This is not horror, this is gag manga, but I'll explain the whole transition from this through X-Men and then into her horror career. Um, she'd also done some work on movies. She was in The Marionaire, which is a wild B-horror movie produced by Junji Ito. Also, Ochezuke Nori was in it, a couple other mangaka. And she was recently, in 2019, on the Amazon Prime show hosted by Yamasaki Toru, the horror mangaka, called Kyofu Manga Gekijo, or Horror Manga Theater. In the first episode, uh, Toru... Yamasaki Toru interviews Hino Hideshi, which was awesome. And then in the second episode, uh, Kojima Miyako. Um, throughout the years, she said in multiple interviews that she was really influenced by Umez, Hino Hideshi, Inuki Kaneko, and then some other mangaka that she had worked under, of course, um, Hagiwara Reiji. And there was one other gag, uh, Shiriagari... Kotobuki was where she got her gag influence from in her early days. But what I'd like to do is show you some of her panels from her Tankobon, from a lot of her manga releases, and we can compare them with some of those other artists that she has mentioned and a couple other artists that I think may have influenced her strongly as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, let's take a look at some of Kojima Miyako's works. As I noted before, as an assistant, she went under the pen name Neko Miyako, but with her first 1992 release, which is this, Junama Kiddo, she started going under the name of Kojima Miyako. Here we can even see in the, just look at how 90s that is, that's sick. Tankobon ga deite ureshi. So she's happy that she was able to release a Tankobon and her new name as a solo artist. Um, as I had mentioned before, a lot of her gag influence is due to 
her influences from uh, Shiriagari Kotobuki. But um, to be honest, I'm not so familiar with him, but this is definitely a gag manga. If we, the story is we have this uh, Tanizaki Junsei. Tanizaki Junsei. He moves from Aomori to Tokyo, and uh, one of his classmates, they're in junior high, he's 13 years old, and one of his classmates is the most famous pop star and idol in the country, Matsubara Ringo. He's a super big fan of hers, and he'll do anything to protect her. At the same time, the class leader and some of the other classmates despise her because she is such a pain in the ass all the time and never follows the rules. So they're always trying to side rail her and do things to kind of, I don't know, get out of class or damage her career. And he is always there to try to save her. But one of the gags is that he's weak, she's strong, she's smart, he's not. So his attempts are often in vain. But uh, this is an awesome, fun read and very different from what we'll see coming up next. All right, then she moved on, as I mentioned before, was asked to do some horror stuff, and she came out with this. The Jigoku series. Jigoku means hell. She did a whole bunch of them. Otome Jigoku, Otome Zukan, uh, Otono Jigoku, and uh, Koromo Jigoku. So kids hell, virgin hell, or maiden hell, um, adult hell, a number of hells in there. And uh, this is one of her, this work is from 2001, I believe. Um, let's take a look at some of these influences in here. So first of all, one common theme in Japanese retro horror is girls and pimples or some sort of disfigurement, something wrong with their looks, being ugly. Um, Inuki Kaneko explored this a whole lot. So in this story, we have Misato-chan no Kibyo, Misato's strange disease. And of course, it has something to do with her face getting like really gnarly. You know, here, starts off small, gets bigger. Before you know it, it is out of control. Incidentally, whose work does this look like? Think about that for a second. So if we go back and see these, pretty wild. This here is Present by Inuki Kaneko. This is a fun series, it's a three-part series, and she also explores this theme. This was released in, you know, nine, early 90s. And in this story, of course, in present, she everyone has some desire. This girl goes around and gives them a present to fulfill their desire, and it always backfires on them. And this one, of course, she starts to get some sort of a blemish. Girl comes around with some magic makeup cream or potion, which starts to disfigure her and turn her into a monster. Look familiar? So we can see some strong Inuki Kane, Kane, Kaneko influences here. Um, of course, because this is like shoujo manga, it's very much geared towards young girls. So that's why some of these themes are like that. But let's go back again to that page I was just looking at. Let's see here. Let's take a look at this. Her face is all deformed. And then let's take a look at Sochan. This is God's left hand, devil's right hand. If you put those side by side, look at the hair, mouths, eyes, shading quite similar. This is where Sochan and his sister are beheaded and stuffed into a refrigerator. Um, I bookmarked another one over here. This is a close up of Sochan. Right? So we can see. So she actually, in her 2002 interview in Otome Zukan, she even says there's two camps of people in Japan. People that love her because she was so heavily influenced by Umez and people that hate her because they feel like she ripped off Umez. But regardless, I mean, her artwork is great. The stories are great. And it really does follow the theme of retro horror, that stuff coming out of the 60s, late 60s through the 90s, right? Then, after this, she went on to do a collaboration. This was with Gankyu Kitan, 
Gonkyu Kitan is not a mangaka, but he's a famous mystery and horror writer of uh, novels. And he teamed up with um, Kojima Miyako to put out this series, Yui. Um, let's take a look here. I bookmarked a few pages in here. So if we look at Yui, the story is much darker than a lot of her stuff because her stuff is very like shoujo muki. It's very much geared towards young girls, but he is a horror and mystery writer. So his stories are a little bit more complicated. It's longer. There's more connections in there. Not taking you away from, you know, uh, Kojima's stories at all, but it was just a different kind of collab. And at that time in 2001, it was quite an original collaboration as well. If you look at this framing, or if you take a look at this character, this is a character from a restaurant that serves very special kinds of food. Or maybe even if we move forward and look at this girl, kind of starts to remind me of someone which the first thing I started to think of was, of course, Tomie. So she doesn't specifically say in any of the interviews I heard that she was influenced by Ito Junji, but look at that there. She might have adjusted her style a little bit to fit the, you know, the, the writing style of Gankyu Kitan. Uh, I found those to be quite, you know, similar in some ways. Now let me go back. Right. Of course, this is how horror manga has been developed in Japan. And elsewhere as well, there's a lot of people borrowing from each other, writing on the same themes. So it's not like a knock on her at all. In fact, it's a great way to represent these retro horror mangaka in more modern manga. All right, there was something, there was one other point I wanted to make. Let's take a look at this one. This is Otome Zukan. As I said before, this is her 2002 release which has the great interview in the back where I got a lot of my information. Oh, that looks very Umez to me. Whoa. Here we can see a clear, very obvious influence. Who is that? Yes, it's Nizumi Otoko from the, from the uh, Mizuki Shigeru Gegege no Kitaro series. She actually uses him in this. This horror story is My Husband Turned Into Nezumi Otoko, which is pretty wild. Then this story. This story has really caught me off guard because it's not like her normal style of stories, which are more bubbly and cute. This is more of a period piece, and we can see that this in this story. A prince falls in love with a mermaid, but she has no legs, so he has to take the legs from someone to give her legs so that they could be together. When I saw this, I really started thinking of someone else. I'm not sure who you think of, but I thought of, and you can see that's a much different style than, than Nikuko-chan here. But I started to think of Hanazawa Kazuchi. He focuses on period pieces, very eroguro, which is quite different from Kojima style. Suisei, this is the story of the water nymph that crawls into people and then blasts out of them and kills them. All right, another Hanawa that I thought of. Nikuyashiki, or the meat room. This is a wild story about relationship 
that turns into a kind of like a love triangle-ish thing, if I recall correctly, that turns into murder and cannibalism. But I felt like, you know, there's might be some influence there with, you know, if we go back and look at this, see some parallels there. I like the patterns, background patterns. That's something that Hanawa does a lot too. Or maybe Maruro, if you're into Eroguro. Yeah, so I found that connection pretty, pretty interesting as well. This is the interview in the back where I got just tons of information about her. So that was a great 2002. Koji Mimiyako's Otome Zukan. All right, and one of her most famous series, of course, was Nikuko-chan. So Nikuko-chan is a very big, heavy girl, always teased at school. And sometimes she's the center of the story, but a lot of times she's just kind of narrating us through some other horrors happening to someone else. So this... Again, we're seeing that Umez just pop up everywhere, right? Very cool. There is Nikko-chan. And here, instead of, of course, there's the famous story, which I did a whole video out about, um, that Inuki Kaneko also did. The Kuchisake Ona Densetsu, or The Legend of the Split Mouth Woman, famous story from 19, late 1978 through the summer of 79, became a great urban legend, always starts off like this. She did an adaptation of this called uh, Niku Sake Ona Densetsu. So instead of Kuchi, mouth, it's meat, or Nikuko chan, something, someone who's really big and heavy, right? Um, in fact, there we have the story. This is kind of a parody of the split mouth woman. She's showing her body here. What's she showing? Well, there's some murder involved, that's for sure. Let's move this off for a second. Incidentally, wow, can I find it? Okay, I picked up this. This is a this is an anthology that she was in, in, I believe, quite long ago. Oh, no, wait, this is the newer one, 2017. Let's see what we got here. Kuchi Sakeru Otome, or the maiden with the split mouth. So she actually, in 2017, did a remake of the Kuchisake Ona Densetsu, but changed it a little bit. And this one's a really weird twist one because it's about father, daughter, and a dead mother's, their relationship with that legend. So she did really address the original at some point, but in Nikuko-chan, she focuses on Nikuko's character and always heaviness. Right? And then we can see if we go look at, for example, Saga Miyuki. Saga Miyuki is a famous Hibari, um, Hibari sh Shobo comics um, artist who put out just, you know, a hundred, who knows how many. And of course, she's famous for doing the Kushisake Ona to Ohaka ni Teishu. Teikubi, 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 Teikubi means. Right here, we have the Kuchisake Ona. So you can see it all looks really familiar, right? And then there she is. She'll always go up to someone and say, am I pretty? Am I pretty with her mouth covered? And then she will reveal her mouth and say, am I pretty now? And Nikuko-chan is a similar lines, but about am I pretty, am I pretty? But of course it's not her mouth, right? Then this is the Inuki Kaneko version here, Kuchisake Ona Densetsu, which is just a straightforward story. And um, if we go to this page here, almost exactly the same, always standing by a pole on the side of the road in the shadows, 
waiting for a child to pass by, or sometimes an adult to pass by, where she can ask them if she is pretty. Here's, incidentally, number two. And you can see her in the background, hiding behind a pole, creeping around over there. One more thing I kind of want to bring up. Oh, wait, and then before we move on, and in the Kuchisake Onaten Setsu, there's a rumor with the kids that pomade, that the, the lady hates the smell of pomade or like hair grease. But in this one, the Nikusake Ona, instead of pomade, they throw their pen cases in Nikuko chan's face because they think that she is the killer. I thought that was pretty funny. And one last connection here before we wrap up. All right. I was looking at Nikuko-chan. Of course, Nikuko-chan is, uh, is escorting us through a bunch of horror stories. And at the end of each one, check her out here. Walking away into the night, hungry. Onaka hetta. She is hungry. She's always hungry. She can eat anything and anyone, incidentally. It's kind of her superpower. Who did that remind me of? Of course, that's a common trope in retro horror of having some sort of a narrator. I mean, the Crypt Keeper did it, EC comic stuff. You always you saw this a lot throughout comic history, but it really reminded me of Hino Hideshi's Onimbo, because Onimbo also guides us through a number of tales. And of course, he is there to expel the hell bugs from that are terrorizing people's minds inside their bodies and then eat them for his own gratification and see him walking off into the distance, singing his song here. Ochiro yo, ochiro yo. I'm not gonna sing the whole thing cause I suck at singing. And there he is walking off again, singing his song into the night. I mean, of course it's, and people can even say she's doing a paku, or she's kind of just copying. Look at how, look how straight up that is. But no, it's homage to the greats that came before her. And that's why I really like her manga releases. There's a few other connections in there. Of course, some of these are my conjecture, of course. And some of these are straight up from her interviews, these connections. Of course, Hino, Umez, Inuki, she said in the past. Some of the other ones like Hanawa, possibly uh, Maruo, the Eroguro influences, a little bit different, um, who knows. But that's what I felt when I was going through her stuff. Um, great, Kojima, Miyako, I hope you guys can find some of it out there in English or you know, I hope somebody does something to get some of it out there. Always, thanks to everyone who subs, likes, and shares. You guys are the bee's knees. You keep me going. It's really fun. Sorry I've been a little bit slower with videos lately, but there's a lot of reading and connections and stuff that I have to do to put one of these videos together, so please be patient. I got some more stuff coming up soon, some suruta, like box opening, um, gosh, some atsushi Kaneko. I just picked up Evolve volumes one and two, and I'm also reading uh, Search and Destroy. I already finished Evolve. It's great, great. Can't wait for that to get out. And um, some other stuff. So check back in, guys. I really appreciate it. Also, um, thanks to Starfruit Books, Matt over there. He's the one who introduced me to Kojima Miyako, and I just kind of fell in love with her stuff. So go over to his website, check out the books he's got. I know right now that he's doing a pre-order of Hino Hideshi's City of Pigs in English, which, you know, Hino hasn't been translated into English for years, so get on over there and pre-order your copy now. All right, we're on Insta, you know, not really Twitter, but I'm over there, and we have a Discord. Hit that link down below if you want to join us in our Discord. It is fun, lots of recommendations. Everyone's very cool. So thanks again for watching. Check out some Kojima Miyako if you have a chance, and until next time, do 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 matane.